this morning, we're in a series called What Really Matters, and it's out of the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you have been following along, you know that we are entering into chapter 3 today. We're going to look at God's immutable providence. Uh, the word immutable, just in case you don't know, I know it's a, you know, $10 word, but it means unchanging or unable to change. And the word providence really comes from a, a Latin word, providentia, and it really means to forbear, to prepare for the future. And so in God's ultimate providence that is unchangeable, he is working in our lives. He is shaping, moving, always in our world. So Solomon begins this section with an argument that revolves around the repetition of a single word. The word time. We're going to see it in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. We'll see it again in verse 11. We'll see it in verse 17. Solomon argued that God has appointed a time for everything. That's right. Your hardships, your joys, your good times, and your bad times. God has appointed a time for everything under the sun. All this is a part of the eternal, immutable providence of God. He's unchangeable. He works in creation because it is his creation. Amen? It's his. So he presents for us four arguments throughout this letter. Solomon does. Proving that life was nothing but grasping after broken soap bubbles or a chasing after the wind. But he was too wise a man to let his own arguments go unchallenged. He's challenging himself, which is something that we should all learn to do. We should challenge what we're thinking and why we're doing what we're doing. We should evaluate our actions according to the word of God. We evaluate our thoughts. That's why the Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. So as Christ followers, we need to evaluate what am I doing and why am I doing it. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. So Solomon, from chapter 3 all the way through 10, is re-examining each of these foundations carefully. And his first argument was the predictability of life. We saw that in chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. And he examined it again from chapter 3, where we're starting today, all the way through chapter 5, verse 9. And he's laying out for us these four factors that we must consider that are foundational for life. They're principles, they're truths that we need to stand on. The first is simple. Life is temporary. It really is. It's transitory. It's always changing. It's never the same. Second, death is inevitable. Nobody's getting out of here alive. It's inevitable for every one of us. It's something that we don't like to think about. It's something we don't like to talk about, but it is a reality that will hit us. And when that happens, the third fact or foundation that is absolutely true is that judgment is Unavoidable. You will give an answer to God. You will stand before God and answer for every decision, for every choice, for every word that was uttered out of your mouth because of foundation number four. Eternity is undeniable. We will live forever. God created us as eternal beings. And we will either live for all eternity with God in heaven or we will live for all eternity apart from God in hell where the fire never dies, where there will be pain and agony and torment for all eternity. Solomon came to these conclusions because he saw something above man. A God who was in control of time, who balanced life experiences. God created time so that we could experience moments 
and hours and days and weeks and months and years. It's for our benefit. God is outside of time. He's eternal. So there is no time for God. But for us, we need to measure our life. And we measure it by minutes and hours and days and weeks and years. And the older we get, the more we realize that time is fleeting. So first he saw that there was something above God. But then he saw there was something within man that linked him to eternity. He has eternity written in his heart. And we'll see that in verses 9 through 14. And third, Solomon saw something ahead of man, which is the certainty of death. And he will discuss that in verses 15 through 22. And we'll look at that next week. And then finally, he saw something around man, the problems and the burdens that we all experience. Life is far from pain-free. We all struggle. Different trials, different events, but life is filled with pain. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He didn't say, oh, it could possibly fall upon you. He said, you will have trouble. But then he said, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Our hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not in your career. It's not in your bank account. It's not in your retirement. It's not in your relationships. It is in Jesus Christ alone. So the preacher asked his listeners to do a few things, to look up, to look within, to look around, and to take into consideration time, eternity, death, and suffering. Those four foundational aspects, these factors that are a part of our everyday life, which when we understand them, they keep us from living a life apart from God. And that was his thesis for the first two chapters, right? Under the sun. Remember the phrase? Life under the sun. It's a life apart from God. We don't want to live a life apart from God because he is our only hope. So we're going to consider two of these factors. We're going to look at them today. And then next week we'll look at the next two. The first factor is that everything has its time. Everything. So he starts in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. He says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Solomon said there is a time for every activity under heaven. Each activity has its proper time or a, a point in time. And then he used the word season, which season means a duration. Have you ever heard the phrase, you're just in a season of life? Right? We think that way, right? It's a duration. It's a period of time. But it's just a season of life. And we are constantly going from one season to another season to another season. We're always in a season of life. And those seasons are always based on the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. Because he is the one that is orchestrating all of our events, all of our circumstances for our own good. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Because he is using these things to shape us and mold us and to help us to be the people that he created us to be. So he followed his general statement with a poem on 14 opposites. That's right, 14 opposites, each of which happen in its time. And the fact that Solomon utilized polar opposites, these are all the poem, complete polar opposites in a multiple of seven. So there are seven and then seven. And they all build off each other. And he began his list with birth and death. 
He said, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, birth, and a time to die, death. And this is highly significant because it will build from here. So the number seven suggests the idea of completeness. Seven represents the idea of completeness. And the use of the polar opposites, it's a well-known political device called merism, which suggests totality. It's not only completeness, but it's infinite. It's totality. God is going to teach us that he is sovereignly in control of all things and how we should respond to his sovereignty. So the first Bible verse that I ever memorized. Do you guys remember the first verse? I mean, I do. I was young. I was a new believer. And I read Psalm 139. And I was just taken back by the providence of God and the sovereignty of God. I'm a young believer, right? I've got no theology. I don't know what I believe or why I believe. But I was just amazed at that psalm. And so I put it to memory. And the first three verses are so amazing. I wanted to share them with you this morning. So Psalm 139 starts off, O Lord, you searched me and known me. You have known me. He knew you before you were born. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. And then you come down to verse 14, actually starting in 13 all the way through 16. And he talks about how God knit you together in the womb. And he says, all the days ordained for me. What does ordained mean? It means that God established them. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God has laid out your life. He is at work in you. And the only reason you're here this morning is because of his grace and because of his mercy and because of his love for you. And it's our job to trust him. He knows what he's doing. And so Solomon intended to affirm that all a person's activities, both constructive and deconstructive, and all his responses to people, objects, events, happen in their time. The list begins with the reference, the beginning of a person and the end of a person's life. Two events over which no one has control. Did you choose when you would be born? What generation? Did you choose who your parents would be? Where? I mean, a lot, a lot of you like to trade in your parents. You're like, oh, man, if I could do it my way, I wouldn't have had these two. But you couldn't choose. It was God's choice. You didn't choose what race you would be, ethnicity. You didn't choose where you would be born. You had no control over it. And the second thing that you will have no control over is when you die. It's all in God's hands. It's up to him. He chooses when you'll be born, and he chooses when you'll take your last breath. Displaying, again, God's immutable providence. It's up to God. God is sovereign, meaning that he has absolute power over all things. And because he has absolute power over all things, he influences and controls through his providence. That's how he works in our lives. And he does it, one, and most importantly, for his glory. It's all about his glory. Because nobody else deserves glory. Nobody else is worthy. So he does it first for his glory, and second, which blows my mind that he actually loves us. 
He does it for our good because he loves us. The only reason we love him is because he first loved us. Because we are wretched and depraved. We are all like sheep who've gone astray. It's not like you woke up one day and said, wow, man, this God thing, I, I got to check this out. You know, I, I got to find God. No, God drew you. God saved you and God keeps you. You're never going to lose your salvation because you didn't earn your salvation. You can't lose what you didn't earn. So he continued by referring to the deliberate acts of the one people who begin and end. And so he goes to, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. So it's things that we do, right? This is our response to who God is and what God has done. He chose when we be born. He chooses when we be died. And our response is we plant and we pluck up. A time to kill and a time to heal. You say, when is there a time to kill? Trust me. There is a time to kill. He doesn't say murder. Two different words. He's not talking about murder. But there is a time to kill. In war, people kill other people. They're not murdering them. They're not vengeful. They are defending their country. And so there is a time to kill and there is a time to heal. And then he says, and a time to break down and a time to build up. And it seems that all these suggest the concept or from the concept of birth and death. And then he moves to verses 4 through 6, which is still a part of this poem. He says, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. So now from the concept of death and destruction, Solomon wrote of the human responses to these events. People experience weeping and mourning. If you've lost somebody that you've loved, you know that experience. Weeping and mourning. And their opposites are what? Laughing and dancing. Two activities by which joy is expressed. And if I'm, if I'm completely honest, I've seen some of you dance and it's not very joyful. <laughs> At least not for me. Because as an observant, I'm like, oh, this is ugly. Some people just dance ugly. So in verse 5, we see there's a time to cast away stones. So you say, what does that mean? And a time to gather stones together. So now he's moving into the relationship aspect of community. So if you understand Israel, you understand Jerusalem, stones everywhere. Everything was built with stones. So there's a time to work together in community to build temples, to build houses, to build projects. But there's also a time to cast these stones away. There's a time to tear it down, break it down. There's opposites. In both ways, it's like the same side of a coin. One side is heads, the other side is tails. There's building and there's tearing down. And the thought of keeping and throwing away. There are some stones that you say, well, this is a good one. And then you're like, oh, this is too small. And you throw it away, right? You're not going to keep every stone. So there's the keeping and there's the throwing away. So then he spoke of the display of affection. So it moves from relationships in community to relationships probably between a man and a woman. And he says, uh, there's giving up, loss, and there's keeping a thing. There's throwing it away. And there's seeking it. Some people are seeking relationships. And some people are throwing relationships away. One of my favorite parts in this passage is that there's a time to embrace. Look, there's a time when people need a hug. 
I preached a message once, and I was talking about, you know, the culture, about a holy kiss, kind of like greeting and how important it is to show affection to one another in the body of Christ. And there was a guy in this church who took it upon himself to not only hug me, I'm not talking about you, Tony, but he kissed me. Man, he's lucky we were in church. Because there is a time for affection, but there's a time to refrain. And when it comes to showing me that kind of affection as a man, refrain. So if you got any ideas, keep them to yourself. Yeah, there is a time to embrace, but there's also a time to refrain from embrace. And we have to understand that what he's dealing with here is man's interest in buildings and things and in relationships, keeping and throwing away. Because there are some relationships that are unhealthy. Some relationships are toxic. You get stuck in one of those and you have to set boundaries. You got to be like, this is unhealthy for me. I cannot continue to allow you to abuse me over and over and over. That's why boundaries are so important in relationships. You say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget. And I'm not going to keep putting myself out there to be hurt over and over and over. It's unwise. And so there is a time to throw away. And there is a time to seek. And the critical aspect in all of this is the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes we don't know when it's time to set a boundary. We don't know when it's time to throw away. We don't know when it's time to build. So we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, which is his role in our walk. His role is to lead us and guide us in all things. That's why we are called to be filled with his spirit. We need wisdom and discernment. That's why Ephesians 5.15 says, make the most out of every opportunity because the days are evil. What did he say right before that? To be wise. We need his wisdom. And then he says in verse 18, to be filled with the spirit because it's all connected together so that we are doing the things that we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it. Then he says in verse 7 and 8, a time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now that part, a time to keep silent, many of you have never read that before. So I want you to be aware there is a time to zip it. You ever met those people that just can't ever, man, whatever's on their mind, they just got to blurt it out. Man, you just want to smack them. Like, come on. Is that necessary? Whatever they think, they think they have to tell everybody. There is a time to be silent. And then there is a time to speak out. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. So verse 7 refers to our actions associated with mourning and grief. Right? He says, a time to tear. It's tearing of one's clothes. If you were Jewish, you would understand the culture. When they were in mourning, they would go to sackcloth and ashes, and they would tear their clothes, and they would put dirt on their heads, and they would grieve. You can read Job. I mean, if you remember the story of Job, you get to chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Man, he's covered in boils. And his friends show up and they see him for the first time. And they rip their clothes and they pour dirt on their heads and they sit in silence as they mourn and grieve. So just as there's mourning and grieving, during those times, you need to be silent. Sometimes it's better just to sit with somebody. You know, when I was a young pastor, and somebody would lose a loved one. Man, I would try to help them to feel better. I would try to encourage them. And what I learned in the process was I just needed to be there. It was better just to be there and to be silent than to try to fix their problem. Because they don't need to be fixed. 
They need somebody to grieve with them. They need somebody to mourn with them during their loss. And so on the flip side, there is a time to get out your needle and thread and sew. There's both a time to tear and a time to sew. So sometimes we got to get out the needle and the thread and we got to start sewing things up. Reconciliation, restoration. We got to help people. Got to bring people back together and a time to speak out. So there are times when you see people hurting themselves and it's time to speak out. You got to say, hey, what you're doing is just killing yourself. Because we're in this together. And so there's a time to be silent and to grieve and mourn with somebody. And there's a time to patch things up and to help somebody. So you know what? you got to forgive that person. You're walking with bitterness in your life. And you're not getting better. You're getting bitter. And because you're bitter, you're holding on to anger. And you're smothering yourself. And I'm telling you this because I love you. And because I care about you. You've got to walk in forgiveness. You don't got to reconcile right now. But that's always the goal. But right now, you need forgiveness and boundaries so that you are free. Because forgiveness isn't about the other person. It's about setting yourself free. When you forgive, you are the one who finds freedom. Do you think the person that you're holding a grudge against cares about what you think or what you're going through? They probably don't even know. They're just living life and you're all angry and you're bitter and you're upset and you're thinking about them all the time, exhausting your mental energy, wasting your life over something somebody did to you five years ago and you won't let it go and it's just eating at you. You've got to forgive. It doesn't mean you've got to reconcile, but you've got to let it go. You've got to lay it at his feet. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you you got to bring it to the Lord. And every day, Lord, help me to forgive. Help me to walk in your forgiveness. Until one day you get up and you won't think about it anymore. Just every day you go before the Lord, you lay it down. Because every day you're still thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, one day you're going to get up and you're not going to think about it. And you don't got to bring it to him. And then a week will go by and you won't be thinking about it anymore. And then every time it pops up, you bring it back to the Lord. And before you know it, you are walking in forgiveness. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32 that we must forgive one another as God forgave us in Christ Jesus. Forgiving one another. Because nobody's perfect and people are going to hurt you. Sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. But either way, when you hold on to unforgiveness, you become bitter and angry and it just eats you alive. So then he closed his list of opposites by referring to life's two basic emotions, love and hate. It's like the same side of the same coin. The more you love somebody, the more you can hate somebody. Think about this. If somebody comes up to you on the Street corner. You don't know them. They say, man, you're ugly. Your mama's fat. She sat on a rainbow and made Skittles. You're right? They're just <laughs> messing you up, telling, you know, just trying to, whatever. You don't care. You're like, whatever, bro. See ya. Because you're not in a relationship with them. You're not going to get all angry and bent out of shape because you don't even, you're like, you're a loser. You don't care. But somebody you really love, and the more you love them, says something to you, and it's like a knife, and they talk about your character, it just cuts you. And the rage, the anger. Because the more love you have, the more hate you can have. It's two extremes of the same emotion. And that's why he says, the most hostile expression of hate is what? War. That's why he goes from love and hate to war, which is the opposite, is peace. And I love the way he ends this just like he began it. And I believe it's significant because he closes the list with these opposites, war and peace, over which a person might have little control. 
if China attacks us, we go to war. We have no control over whether Russia attacks us or China attacks us. We have no control over that. But we will respond, and there will be a war, right? Even if we didn't want it, we're in it. And the same thing with peace. If you want peace with somebody, but they won't reconcile with you, you can't have peace with them. These are things that are out of your control, depending on the circumstances. Now, the Bible does say to live at peace with all men, to do all things possible to live at peace with all men. That should be our job. We should be striving for peace. But sometimes peace is not possible because of the other person. Does that make sense? Just like war. So he ends this just like he began it. Because all these things happen in time. And how we respond in time matters. Because we are his ambassadors. Right? We, we are representing God in the way we respond to these circumstances. To the way we respond to these events in time. And then second, he moves to the reality that everything has its purpose. Not only does everything happen in time, but it happens in purpose. So verse 9 and 10 says, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So the preacher adjusted his sights. So first two chapters, life under the sun. That is life apart from God. But now he's going to bring God into the equation, which is going to change his perspective. So he brings God into the picture, which gave him a new perspective. So he repeated his opening statement that he made in chapter 1, verse 3. In all this labor, basically, is it really worth it? I mean, I worked my whole life, but it's vanity, vanity. It's all meaningless. Like, what's the point? So he's asking the same question. What gain has the worker from his toil? I want to give you three answers to this question. Or actually reasons. I want to give you three reasons why your toil is worthwhile. First, if you're taking notes, I would really encourage you to write these three things down because you need to build these principles into your daily life. First, life is a gift from God. Life is a gift from God. In view of the struggle that we experience from day to day, because it's tough, life may seem like a strange gift. But still, all the same, it is a gift from God. And I can tell you from experience, when I thought I was going to die, when I got hit by a bus, I realized how precious this life is. People are always like, oh, I just want to die. You don't understand. This is unique. I mean, heaven's awesome. There's nothing compared to being with Jesus. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. When you get to heaven, you're never going to watch a baby grow up. You're never going to have a baby. There's never going to be marriage. There's not going to be moms and dads and brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts. There's not going to be male and female. You're never going to age. You say, thank God. Well, no, there's some good things to aging. I'm a lot wiser today than I was 30 years ago. And hopefully in the next five years, if I live another five years, I'll be wiser still. So there are things to be learned in this life that you will never experience again when you're gone. And so this is really a gift. Life is a gift. And if we believably accept that life is a gift, 
and learn to thank God for it every moment of every day. Like, thank you that I get to walk through this life. Regardless of my struggles, regardless of my trials, regardless of all that is against me, thank you for the gift of life. It will impact your attitude. It will change your perspective because you'll realize that this is a blessing. But if you begrudgingly accept life as a burden and are always negative and depressed, you'll miss out on the gifts that God has given us through this life. And hear me, outlook helps to develop outcome. In your perspective, your outlook affects the way you think. And people who are always negative and critical are always looking for what they don't have instead of being thankful for all that they do have. Life is a gift. And I'm not saying that it won't be tough. But if your perspective is rife, instead of getting bitter, you'll get better. Let, let, let me just say this, and, and I mean this with all my heart. Suffering is a gift. Nobody wants to suffer, but when you suffer, it is truly a gift because it draws you closer to Jesus than you would ever be without it. It grabs our attention, it holds us, and it changes us all at the same time. We can't even see it happening. But God knows what he's doing because he's sovereign and providentially working all things out for our good and for his glory. Verse 11 says, he has made everything, love it, beautiful. Well, Solomon's like, whoa, wait a minute. With God, it is beautiful. For he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So the second principle here is life is linked to eternity. Like you have an eternal connection that is critical. Man was created in the image of God. And was given dominion over all creation. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Meaning that we are different from the rest of creation. We are above all of God's created beings. We have been given dominion. People are afraid of the devil. You don't ever got to fear him. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. You don't have to worry about demons and like, oh, man, they're going to get me. <laughs> man, just follow Jesus, love Jesus, serve Jesus, surrender to Jesus, and they can't touch you. Nothing's going to happen to you that God doesn't allow. Look at Job. Oh, yeah, it was tough for Job. But there was a reason. It was tough for Paul. But God was using him greatly and shaping him. And I'm not saying that life won't be tough, but you have eternity in your heart. And so does every person ever. We're eternal creatures. And everybody, hear me, has an eternal destination. Which explains why nobody, including Solomon, can be satisfied with his achievements or successes in this world. Because this is not our home. So no matter how much you do, no matter how much you have, you'll never be satisfied here. You just got to learn to be content with where you are, knowing that God is at work in you and through you. And that's why we can't understand a lot of the stuff that happens. Things happen and you're like, God, why? Look, don't ask why. Ask what? What do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? Not why. Why me? Why, God? We need to learn how to respond. Because God accomplishes his purpose in his time. Bottom line, it's always his purpose in his time. And it will not be until we enter eternity that we'll begin to comprehend some of these things. 
There are things that you're never going to understand. You lose a spouse. You lose a neighbor. You lose a child. It doesn't make sense. It's like you, You're like, why would God take my child and let the murderer live? It doesn't make logical or rational sense to you. But God is greater than our thoughts. And that's why we have to live by faith. And the goal is to trust him regardless of what we think. You can't trust your logic. You can't trust your reason. That's why you have to take your thoughts captive and make them biblical. We need a biblical worldview so that we are seeing life through his eyes. Understanding that his ways are above our ways, right? Romans eleven thirty three. We can't understand them. So we trust him even though we don't understand what's going on in the world. No matter what's happening to us or through us. All we're responsible for is how we respond. That's it. You can't control what happens to you. But you can control how you respond. Verse 12 and 13, Solomon says, I perceive that there is nothing better for them. Who's the them? People in general. For them than to be joyful and to do good. So, look, the best thing is to be joyful. Well, how do you become joyful? By being thankful. You're never going to be joyful if you're not thankful. You know what most people lack? Joy. In this room, a lot of people don't experience joy. And the reason they don't experience joy is because they're not grateful. They're not thankful. They're not living in thanksgiving. But when you're thankful, you're filled with joy because of the relationship, knowing this is not your home. You're just passing through. As long as they live, he says, be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. What is it? It's a gift. Look, your job, it's a gift. I hate my job. It's just a job. It's not your life. You do your job because God gave it to you to pay your bills. And if you're young enough, find a job that you enjoy. And if you're old, stick with what you got. Because it's too late. Sorry. But if you're young enough, man, find something that you're going to enjoy doing every day. And if you're stuck in a job, then learn to enjoy it by being grateful that you have a job, that it provides for you, that it puts food on the table and clothes on your back. Be thankful. This is God's gift to you. So the third point that I want to make here, the third principle is life can be enjoyable right here, right now. Think about Jesus, John 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life, life abundantly, right here, right now. Paul says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. You don't got to be bound up in your sin. You don't got to be bound up with your worry. You don't got to be bound up under anxiety. You don't have to live with stress and fear. You are free in Christ to enjoy this life to its fullest. It's a gift. It's a blessing. And learn to enjoy it. He hinted at that in chapter 2, verse 24, but he was careful to say that this enjoyment in life is a gift from God. It's part of the theme of Ecclesiastes, and he's mentioned it in each of the four sections. He does. He mentions it over and over because he's encouraging us to find joy in what God has gifted us, our toil, to find pleasure in this life. And he's not talking about pagan hedonism. He's talking about Enjoying the fruits of your labor. I used to be a painting contractor. And one of my favorite things would be to show up at a house that looked like garbage. It looked horrible, man. You could tell it's got mildew all over it. Hadn't been washed in 15 years. 
peeling everywhere. You scrape it down, you pressure wash it, and then you paint it. And then you step back, and it's like a new creation. It's beautiful. You see the transformation. And that's what God is doing in every one of us from glory to glory. He's transforming us from the inside out, and we should be grateful. And a part of that transformation is through the fruit of your labor. He wants to use you at work, no matter how difficult it might be. Life appears to be transitory, right? Temporary. But whatever God does, he does forever. And so when we live for him, when we live in him and through him, life has meaning and it's manageable. So instead of complaining about what you don't have, because that becomes the issue how this was unfair, how I didn't get that, how somebody treated me this way, or I need this. Instead of complaining about all the things you don't have, start thanking him for all the little things that you do have. The fact that you got ten toes and ten fingers. You say, well, I only have nine toes. Well, thank him for the nine. You could have none. Learn to walk in thanksgiving. So instead of complaining, Enjoy what we do have and thank God for it. He says in verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures for a little while. Is that what it says? No. Forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Nothing can be added to it. God's got a plan. You're not going to change his mind. And nothing can be taken from it because he alone is sovereign. Look, I love biographies. I've said that several times. I I read recently a well-known British Methodist pastor. He said, Methodist? Well, that's when the Methodists were good. There was a time right after John Wesley that the Methodists were, they're not anymore. Don't find yourself in a Methodist church. Their doctrines have changed significantly. They used to believe in eternal security. They used to believe in, well, I dare say it, in the reality that you can't resist the grace of God. And I know that might be stepping on your toes, but that's the truth. You can't resist God. He's God. You can't tell God no. Look at Jonah. Jonah. Jonah tried to tell God no. Look where that got him. Swallowed by a fish. Look, God is sovereign. And if he wants you, he's got you. It's, but anyway. (laughs) So William, William Sangster learned that he had progressive muscular atrophy. So it's when your muscles begin to fade and die. There was actually a movie just recently called Father Stew where Mark Wahlberg plays the same disease, right, where your muscles begin to deteriorate and you can't function, you can't, I mean, without your muscles, you can't move your hands, your feet, it usually starts in the legs, works its way, it's it's incurable, you can't cure it either. And so he he got this disease as a pastor knowing that he was going to die. And it's a really painful death. Because as your body and your muscles begin to atrophy, it works its way all the way up the body until lastly your facial muscles where you can't chew or swallow and you die. So he made four resolutions, four resolutions that I want to share with you that I think are worthy for us. He said, I know I'm going to die. So I made these resolutions before God, and he lived them until he died. His resolution number one, I will never complain. So let's start with that one. The Bible says, do all things without complaining and grumbling, that you might shine like the stars in the universe, holding out the word of truth. That's what it says. Read Philippians chapter 2. So he said, I resolve. If anybody had something to complain about, 
Why me, God? I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. I'm a writer. He was a writer, a teacher, preacher. I will not complain. Second resolution. I will keep the home bright, meaning that it's not going to be dull. We're not going to be depressed at my house. No matter how bad it gets, I want people to be filled with humor and laughter and love. I don't want them to pity me. I don't want them to look down and feel sorry for me. I want them to be filled with joy. Third, I will count my blessings. You're like, what kind of blessings do you have when you are dying? So many. Because in his suffering, he's learning and he's growing and he's changing. And he's growing closer and closer to Jesus because of his suffering. His spiritual life is flourishing. And he is counting his blessings. And his fourth resolution that he kept till he died, I will use this for gain. Whatever God allows in your life, and let me just say this, nothing happens without God allowing it. Nothing. May it be for his glory. Use it for gain. Allow God to work in it and work through it. Solomon's not saying, don't worry, be happy. That's not the theme. He is promoting faith in God. Not faith in faith, which is the charismatic movement. It's, you know, new age, worked into the church. You got to have faith in your faith. Because it's not about the faith. It's really about the object of your faith. I mean, you can believe in a light bulb, but a light bulb won't save you. A light bulb can't change you. I mean, it might shock you if you stick your finger in it. But it won't change you. It's always about the object of our faith. There's no pie in the sky stuff. Because that's what's happened to American Christians. Like they think everything's going to be easy. I'm a Christian now. It's going to be a, a rose garden. Life's going to be easy. I'm never going to struggle. That's not true. That is not true. Go read about Thomas and Peter being crucified upside down and Paul being uh, beheaded. I mean, there's so much suffering in the church and we think somehow because we're American Christians, we should be exempt. Look, I'm not trying to step on your toes. But if the shoe fits, wear it. The reality is, is we need to be okay with our trials and our hard times and knowing that God is at work, even when it's hard. Because he alone can be trusted. You can't trust anybody else, but you can trust Jesus. He loves you. He proved his love for you, dying on the cross. I mean, how much more? God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What else he got to do? I mean, he died for you. He loves you. He has your best interest at heart, and he will do what is best for you even when you can't understand it. So let me just ask you, think about this, all right? How can your life be meaningless when God made you as a part of his eternal plan. If God created you for eternity and he has saved you, how is your life insignificant? Do you realize how special you are? You are a child of God. If he has saved you and redeemed you and adopted you, you are his. You got nothing to complain about. Just the way it is. He's preparing for you an eternal home that far outweighs anything that we're going to face here. So there's another guy who I read. I like biographies, all right? Puritan pastor, born 1620, uh, died uh, 1686. So he's a Puritan pastor, Thomas Watson. And he said this. I want you to wrap your mind around this. 
Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Sun never goes down. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. The world is in darkness. Your neighbors, your family members, your co-workers are in darkness. What are you going to do about it? Not what is your pastor going to do, not what is your church going to do. What are you going to do? Are you going to share the gospel? Are you going to pray for them? Are you going to love them? Are you going to be a witness to them? What are you going to do? He did this for you. And there are other people out there that are lost and in eternal darkness. And they need to hear the light. They need to see the light. They need to know the light. Jesus is the light of the world. And we have the only message that transforms life. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. It's the only hope. And we have neighbors and coworkers and friends and family members that don't know Jesus. We need to share him. And I know that some people live in that fear But when you have fear of the Lord, which I'm not talking about a a cringing fear. I'm talking about a a submissive, obedient child who loves their parent and wants to obey. Like when Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll obey me. That kind of love that says, I love you. And I have a reverent fear of who you are because you are sovereign and you are awesome. And when you have that fear, it removes all other fears. You're not worried about what people think or what people say. It doesn't matter anymore. Because you are living in light of eternity. And if you find yourself living with worry or anxiety or stress, you're not living by faith. You're living in fear. It's, it's a warning. It's a warning to you. But God, help me to live in faith. I want to walk in faith. I don't want to live like this. I want to live for your glory and for your honor. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to take your word seriously. Help us to learn from Solomon. God, to understand that life, it really is a gift. And it's enjoyable right here, right now. And Father, help us not to be people who are complaining all the time, disgruntled. But help us, Lord, to be thankful and grateful for all that you have done for us. I mean, you died for us. Help us to live in gratitude and to be thankful for all the things that you have blessed us with. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you as the author and perfecter of our faith, that you might use us for your glory. And God, help us to share the gospel whether it's on a street corner or in a restaurant or in a living room. God, help us to be faithful to take your gospel to all people everywhere who are living in darkness. For your glory, God, and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.